In this module, I'll talk about three main reasons that we see similarities among languages. One of the reasons we think of certain languages as hard or certain languages as easy is because they may be similar to the language that I'm learning it from, meaning similar to a language I already know. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how those similarities maybe came into existence. So there's three main ways that historical linguists talk about why languages are related to each other. One is the genetic explanation, and this is sort of thinking of languages in terms of biological organisms. Um, there's a contact explanation and there's a wave explanation. So let's think about the genetic one first. As we talked about in our past module on the histories baked into language, we can see that sometimes languages evolve into two or more daughter languages, that they came from the same population. Usually this happens when there's two people, two groups of people, and they speak the same language, but they become separate. And then the languages slowly over time mutate the same way that biological organisms mutate. Those mutations get picked up and passed on to the children, and so these two languages slowly become different. Maybe the best example of this, if we think about that, is uh, Iceland, um, where the Vikings moved to Iceland. They were originally from Norway and Denmark, and over the many centuries where the Icelanders didn't have contact with the outside world, small changes happened, and today Icelandic is very different than the languages spoken in Norway and Denmark, although they can all kind of understand each other. Another explanation is the wave explanation. This basically says that people in one village eventually start to hear the way that the people in the next village or the next town over talk. And if people like those people, if people think that people in the next door village are cool or influential or powerful, they'll subtly begin to pick up on ways that they speak. And so a feature which might originate, maybe an innovation in one place, gradually spreads across the lines of commerce, of contact, and of transportation to neighboring towns. On this map of Europe, we can see a dark purple region and a light purple region. The dark purple region represents the parts of Europe where you have, instead of the R sound like in America, R, or the R, R sound like you'd hear in Spain or in England, a uvular R. This is sort of the famous French R, R, rouge, uh, or German rot. Right, so this is sort of the hanging ball in the back of your mouth is vibrating. But we can see that even though Germany and France, they have very different language families, and actually German, Denmark, Norwegian, Swedish, that's all part of the Germanic language family. And um, southern Belgium and France and eastern Switzerland would all be part of the Romance language family. It's clear that this R sound spread across that boundary, even though these neighboring languages languages are genetically not very closely related because they had traffic with each other, they had commerce with each other, that uh -huh sound spread. Another good example of this is tonal languages. On this map of Asia and Africa, you can see red languages, red dot represents a language that has a very complex tone system, um, more than three. Um, pink is a simple tone system, so one, two, well, two or three tones, and then white is a language that has no tone. And you can see that these red dots are kind of all next to each other. Even though across Africa, those languages are very different language families. Or in South Asia, we have Sino-Tibetan languages like Mandarin Chinese, but we also have Mon Khmer languages, Hmong languages, languages of other families that don't actually have a strong relationship with each other. Um, and, but these use of tones as a way to distinguish one from another has kind of spread geographically. And we see that also in the New World, where tonal languages tend to cluster in southern Mexico and nowhere else, and they go across language boundaries. So this seems to be a case of a language feature moving from a neighbor to another neighbor. Sometimes we see contact, though, at a, at a big distance. We talked in the last thing about uh, the words for 100 in all of the Indo-European languages. Here we can see a banknote from the Philippines, Sandang Piso. So Sandang is 100 in Tagalog, the national language of the Philippines. Tagalog is an Austronesian language, but yet this looks very similar to those words that we saw for 100 in the Indo-European languages, like centum, kentum, um, sadam, uh, katan. So the Sandang is actually very similar, and it seems like it's related.
Well, that is the case, but it's not because the people in the Philippines descended from the ancient Indo-Europeans and that the Tagalog language is an Indo-European language. Rather, it's because the Spanish explorers brought their own Indo-European language, Spanish, to the Philippine islands, and the Filipinos, who didn't necessarily have their own word for 100, borrowed from the Spanish word cien or ciento, and that became sandang in the Tagalog language. We can see this form of contact actually in English. Um, English is sort of a weird mix of languages. The Norman French overlords in England ruled over Saxon speaking serfs. Um, and the Saxon speaking serfs, they may s mostly did the farm work, they raised the animals, while the rich Norman French speaking overlords were the ones in the fancy manor houses actually eating the animals that were roasted on the table. The Anglo-Saxon servants rarely ever got to eat meat. So we have this interesting case in English today where the words for the animals are clearly related to the German language family. So the German words for sheep, schaf, kalb, kuh. In English, we have sheep, calf, cow um, for the animals. But then the Romance language, the word for the meat that was or the word, these were the words for the animals themselves, actually, in Normandy, in Norman French, mouton for sheep, veau for calf, and boeuf for cow. But those words ended up coming to mean the meat of the animal. So mouton, mutton, is what we call the meat that comes from the animal, the sheep. Veal is the meat that comes from a calf. Beef is the meat that comes from a cow. So we can see something very interesting about the history of the English-speaking peoples, and it also explains a little bit why English is such a strange language that we have a different animal for the meat than or a different word for the animal than we do for the meat. Um, this is all because of contact between two people who spoke very different languages but were put in touch with each other because of conquest, because of commerce, because of immigration, rather than the wave model, which is the slow diffusion of one neighboring village to the next neighboring village to the next neighboring village. So we can see we end up with this tree type diagram. This would be the genetic story for how languages might be similar to each other. We see Proto-Indo-European at the bottom. We see the Italic family, which we might call Romance up at the top. Um, we have Celtic languages, Germanic languages, um, Slavic, Slavonic languages, Iranian, Indic, Greek. Um, and we could see some people were like, well, if we can reconstruct old Proto-Indo-European, could we go all the way back and try to figure out what this ancient mother tongue is, the ancestor of all of the language families, and not just the Proto-Indo-European, but all of the languages ever spoken on Earth? In this diagram, you see someone trying to do that. We have um, this Indo-European tree sort of over here on the right is the main tree, but then we have a bunch of other branches. So Afro-Asiatic, Dravidian of Southern India, the Altaic spoken across Asia, Japanese, Korean, the Austronesian family, which we talked about being spread all across the Pacific and even into Madagascar, um, where Malagasy it's, is itself an Austronesian language, um, the Austroasiatic family, so the languages of Southeast Asia. Then over here we have Sino-Tibetan, which our big leaf Mandarin <laughs> comes from and other various languages of that Sinitic, the Chinese language family, um, like Cantonese or Hakka or Min or Wu, um, Niger-Congo. So some people will say, well, maybe beyond this level, these languages are all connected into the super tree, this mother tree. The problem is once you go back this far with this red box, we're way in the realm of speculation. Language data decays. And it's very, very hard to try to reconstruct the fragments of something that's more than three or 4,000 years old, let alone at this timetable we'd be talking about eight or 10,000 years, which in language time seems like a lot. In terms of evolutionary time, maybe not as much, but we really can't extract language data that allows us to push back. So we really shouldn't trust anything that we see about these potential groupings that are much older than four or 5,000 years. Um, this kind of idea of nostratic, for example, this was invented by Soviet linguists to try to argue that all of the languages of the, of the Soviet Union were actually descended from a single language, which would help justify the Soviet rule over the world. So you can see people trying to reconstruct this proto-nostratic. This was work of some of the Soviet linguists. They were thinking their word for ear or hear was kiwi, which would maybe from 
Cleo, I guess it would be Qlit, Cleo from Proto and European, which we can reconstruct. All of these other ones, Proto Asiatic, Proto Kartvelian, the ancestor of Georgian, um, Altaic, Uralic, Dravidian. So these people were trying to say, oh, there's this Nostratic language that all of these different, very various languages have descended from. But again, we need to take that with a big grain of salt. There's very little chance, probably, that we can say for sure with how decayed, how sparse, how fragmented the language data is. The wave explanation for language relationships or language similarity is another account. In this chart, what we see is a map of lexical similarity. This means what percentage of the words in any given language are shared by others. And so this is a computer chart where languages are grouped together. If two languages are very close, this means they have a lot of the same words. If languages are very far apart, this means they have a lot of very different words. The colors represent the genetic relationships, the genetic subfamilies that these languages are in. You can see the Romance family and the Slavic family. But we see some interesting things. The Baltic language Lithuanian, although it's clearly a Baltic language, shows similarity to its neighbor Polish, but it also shows a lot of words in common with German. So does the Baltic language Latvian, even though there's no relationship here. Just because Germanic Knights have been so active in the Baltic area, there's some lexical similarity. English itself, you can see it's kind of pulled way apart from the, the core block of the other Northern European Germanic languages, and it's much, much closer to French. And in fact, French is also pulled away and has some similarities with Breton, a Celtic language spoken in Brittany, as well as English. So you can see that e these two languages, English and French, even though they're very they're from different genetic roots because of their proximity to each other, have borrowed words across that boundary. Albanian has borrowed from Vlach Romanian, and Romanian has gotten pulled away also from the orbit of most of the Romance languages by this power of the Slavic languages over here. It's kind of moved in that direction, um, and it ends up being closer to Greek, actually. Another kind of diagram for a different group of languages this looks like a normal sort of wave type diagram where we're looking at lexical similarity again, the percentage of the words that have a similar root in each of these different languages, but these aren't your typical language. This is a family of languages that we might call creoles. Um, and most of these ones, especially at the top, are often what we'd call an English-based creole. This, a creole language is a language that grows up when people who don't speak each other's language figure out a common way of speaking between the two of them called a pigeon, and then that pigeon gets learned by their children and becomes their real language, their mother tongue. And so these creoles are spoken all over the world. We have Jamaican creole, Nigerian pigeon, although it's technically a creole. Um, we have Tokpisin, which is spoken in Papua New Guinea. Let's just focus on two. Gala, which is a creole spoken in the Sea Islands of South Carolina and Georgia in the United States. And this is a translation of a verse from the Bible, uh, John 1.1. 1, 1. This is, For God made the world, the word been de. So before God made the world, the word was there. Um, the word been de with God, and the word been God. We can see that a Creole far on the other side of the Atlantic, the Creole called Creo, you can see where the name comes from, spoken in Sierra Leone, has very similar wordings. Before God made the world, the one when they call the word bin donde, it bin de with God, and in God now on. So I have a word for word translation into the modern, the standard English, what we'd say sort of below it. But you can see that even though these languages are on the far side of the Atlantic, and even though the indigenous inhabitants of both regions are totally unrelated to each other, and they're also totally unrelated to English speakers, they end up with a very similar English lexified Creole, and in fact, the Creoles, all of these different Creoles, if you were to look at the same passage translated to them all, you would find some amazing similarities in terms of the grammar, the phonology, and the lexicon of these Creoles. So this is a contact situation where it was the same slavers, the same maritime traders um, that were bringing this sort of English mariner Creole all around the world's oceans to places as far away as Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu, as well as the Caribbean, the shores of Africa, and the shores of North America. And these Creoles kind of took root in many different regions.
So all kinds of history can be read into the language of humans. And once you start thinking about it and looking for it, that kind of stuff is everywhere. I could nerd out all day. But one little fun example is this idea of Norse pairs in English. So before the Normans invaded England, Vikings invaded England and brought plenty of words from Old Norse into the English language. And here's a link to a YouTube video about it. But just a kind of cute set of examples. We have skiff and skipper as a word for a small boat or as a word for someone who controls or drives a boat. But we also in English have ship and shipper. So why would we have skiff and ship, skipper and shipper when there's something so similar? In fact, we have a word skirt and a word shirt. Um, and as you can see this picture of a more Viking style outfit, the same word could equally be applied to this thing. You have scattering, putting things out into many pieces, and then you have shattering, putting things into many pieces. Well, it turns out that the sh ones are the, the Saxon words in English, the sk ones are the Viking words in English, and we end up with both. And what do you do when you have both a skirt and a shirt and they both refer to the same garment? Well, you try to figure out a reason to have two totally different sounding words. So we come up with the word skirt for the bottom part of it, the word shirt for the top part of it, and then we're happy. Um, Mandarin Chinese. Once you start learning other different varieties of Chinese, or maybe some of the varieties of Chinese that you know, actually have far more consonants at the end than Mandarin has. So if we look at the words um, for some of the numbers um, of the Mandarin, of the Sinaitic languages, the Chinese languages, um, Mandarin doesn't have very many consonants at the end. In fact, the only consonants a Mandarin syllable can end in are na and ng. Um, so we have the word liu for six or qi for seven. But in Cantonese, liu is luk and seven is tsat. In Hakka, six is also luk um, and seven is tsit. And in fact, the Proto-Sinitic form, the, the ancestor language of all of the different Chinese languages, six would have been liuk and seven would be tsiet. So Mandarin actually lost all of these final consonants that were kept in other languages like Tocho and Hokkien, uh, Hakka, and Cantonese. Um, and so this is an interesting case of why did Mandarin lose its final consonants while the other Sinaitic languages kept them. Um, that's a very interesting story. The world is full of these interesting stories. There's lots of different ways that we can use language to go back into history. But why does all of this matter for language learners? Well, the, histor the history of languages is why we have regulars and why we have irregulars. All of you in your own language learning have been really frustrated with why are there irregular forms, irregular conjugations, irregular plurals. Um, and the history of the language kind of explains it. And actually, we can find some interesting patterns for why we have certain kinds of irregularity on certain words and on others because of the history of the language. You know, similarity really affects learners' perceptions about which languages are hard and which are easy, which in turn affects their motivation or their willingness to sign up for your class. Um, when you teach a language, you can kind of know there's going to be some things in the target language that learners will already be familiar with. Um, if I'm teaching German to Korean speakers, I know that there's some things that they're going to be fine with, such as marking subjects and objects. Um, they'll be better at it than English learners of German will be. But there's others that they're going to be totally unfamiliar with, such as all of the different fricatives and affricates that are in the German language, and Korean has nothing like that at all. Um, maybe the hardest part is actually ways that languages may be similar, but just different enough to mislead learners. Um, it's like they say that Americans get the worst culture shock in Canada because the two countries are so similar that the learners expect everything to be the same, so the differences that do exist add up. Sometimes it can actually be frustrating to learn a language which is very similar because initially you have data that makes you think, oh, these languages are the same, and then later on you find out they're different. Um, teaching German to English learners Ich kann kommen means I can come in English. You see, oh wow, these are clearly genetically related languages. They're both Germanic languages. It's the same word order. But if I want to say I hope that I can come in German, I have to say ich hoffe, dass ich kommen kann. I hope that I come can. And this throws learners for a loop. Um, they're led to believe when they're looking at single clause sentences that German and English word order is pretty much the same. 
then as soon as you start to get into sentences that are a little bit more complicated, um, you find out the word order is much different. And actually, it's a much more interesting story of what's going on in even the seemingly simple clauses, but we'll save that for another time. Okay, so basically we looked at three ways that languages can be similar, three reasons. They have a genetic relationship, a common ancestry, um, they're neighbors that have borrowed in proximity, or there could be forces of globalization that brought languages into contact um, or brought people into contact across a large distance.